Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mina Daik. I am the Executive Vice President, Market Intelligence at Open Minds, and I will be your moderator for the web briefing today. As you all navigate the new normal that COVID-19 has created, we at Open Minds are here to help you with our executive blueprint for crisis management. Through this program, we are providing on-demand resources and technical assistance to help you both manage through the crisis and also plan for post-crisis recovery. And today, Open Minds Senior Associate Deb Adler will moderate a conversation on caring for vulnerable populations in a social distance world, autism providers, autism service providers implement virtual care delivery. Uh, my colleague Deb Adler brings more than 20 years of experience in executive healthcare roles, serving in a variety of capacities, including network executive, quality management executive, and chief operating officer. Her consultant work with Open Minds spans a broad range of customers, provider organizations, payers, and government programs, as well as topics. Um, she has worked in the areas of collaborative care models, medical behavioral integration, provider network functions, contracting, network design, steering, recruitment, telehealth network implementation, and strategic planning. In addition, Ms. Adler has a special interest in helping tech-enabled providers in go-to markets, strategize and streamline network functions. So uh, Deb is going to introduce our other speakers who you are seeing on your screen today, but I do want to take a quick minute to thank Colin Davidian, Mordecai Meisels, and Yagnesh Vadgama for taking the time to join us today. Open Minds and our members really appreciate it, and we look forward to your insights and expertise. Before I hand it off to Deb, a couple of housekeeping reminders. Uh, you will not be able to speak today. Your audio is muted, so we get good uh, sound quality. But we welcome your questions and comments. Um, just go to the chat box on the right of your screen and type in your questions and send them to us at any time. And um, after the speakers are done sharing uh, their presentations, we will take we will be on the line for as long as it takes to answer your questions. So please feel free to send them in at any time. And uh, I know that one common question, which I will save you asking is, am I going to get the slides? Am I going to get the recording? Um, yes, you will. We will provide the slides and the recording on uh, the Open Minds website. We will send you an email and both should be available um, by tomorrow. So you will hear from us. You can either go to our website or you can look for your email and uh, you'll get the slides and recording. With that, thank you all again for joining us, um, and over to you, Deb. Thank you, Mina. And again, I extend my welcome to our audience members as well. I'm very excited to bring you our three panelists today. I'll give you a little bit about their, their background. Uh, you have Colin Davidian, who is the CEO of Gateway Learning Group. Uh, it's a provider of ABA and autism services in California, Oregon, and Colorado and uh, he founded the company with his wife, Melissa. I'm very excited to have his presentation today. You'll hear a very measurement-focused organization and how they adapted to um, this period of virtual, um, virtual use of telehealth to support autism. So Colin, welcome. Uh, you'll also see Mordecai Meisels, who is the chief clinical officer uh, and founder of Encore Support Services. They're based in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I say, would say the most remarkable thing is they're uh, really in the epicenter of the pandemic in the New York City market. And I know many colleagues have turned to Mordecai in, their, in understanding their approach to using telehealth uh, with this population. So you'll hear more from Mordecai about how they pivoted uh, very quickly and the response and reaction that has resulted. And then last but not least, uh, Yagnesh Vadgama, who's a, a colleague I've known for a few years now. He is the Vice President of Clinical Care Services at Magellan for Autism. Uh, has been with the company a little over four years, so he brings our payer perspective to the panel uh, as well as I may put, give a little bit of input on the payer perspective as well, since that was uh, I have 20 years in that payer space. So I think you're in store for a really great discussion. 
uh, regarding how two organizations have transitioned to, to a virtual approach to autism services and the payer perspective of not only, you know, how is the payer handling this change, what do they see as the long-term approach? So with that, I'm gonna to turn to the, the next slide uh, for just a minute, just uh, again, give you a little overview of the objectives and agenda today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about this new landscape that we're all living in. I guess it's been about six to eight weeks at this point. Uh, in fact, uh, the panelists were just reminiscing about uh, those first weeks in March where they were contacting one another to talk about plans and approaches. So we'll talk about the landscape. Uh, Encore, uh, Mordecai will talk about his program. Uh, Colin Davidian will talk about the Gateway Learning Group. And then we'll provide an overview of how payers are reacting to this change and what uh, we see as the ongoing approach and some lessons learned. So I want to just start off uh, with the next slide. Uh, you know, when I think about autism services and telehealth, and I've been in the telehealth space for many years, really until recently, uh, the only services service that was accommodated through telehealth was supervision. And now, you know, the world is turned upside down and, you know, there's now the ability to provide virtual services uh, across a number of services that would be delivered in the autism and ABA space. So basically, you know, providers and caregivers and family members have had to react very quickly. The good news is we have seen uh, some significant changes in some of the regulatory restrictions. Uh, there's some waiving of co-pays and we'll share some examples of that, that uh, payers have accommodated to help support individuals accessing services during this period. There's been waiving of some of the HIPAA requirements. So for at least this period, a small period of time, the Office of Civil Rights has uh, allowed for non-HIPAA secure um, modalities to be used to deliver services. I would not suspect that'll be the long-term plan, but that can be used to accommodate uh, needs today. Uh, in the autism space, there's still an expectation that services are delivered real-time audio video and not through phone only services, which have been accommodated in behavioral health and addiction services. I think the, the one common theme that I have seen in this quick transition to telehealth is the providers and the family members need a lot of support. Uh, even if you were a program a provider program that offered telehealth services on a limited basis, maybe just for supervision in the autism space. This is a dramatic shift. You are talking about going from maybe, you know, 1% of the utilization or units of your operation to it being, you know, 80 to 90%. So it's a huge shift that really requires, I'll say, extra care and attention to the the change that means for the staff who may not be as familiar or have adopted this approach before. It, it may take a lot of accommodation for the patient and family members who are entering into a new approach as well. And then pile on to that the privacy and security measures needed to be in place to make sure this is a secure approach. So I think one of the things you'll hear from uh, at least my colleague Mordecai in a few minutes is, you know, what type of guidelines, education, et cetera, needs to happen to make this still an effective approach to delivering services. So with that uh, tee up, I'm going to pass it uh, to Mordecai Meisels, who will give you information on his experience right there in the epicenter of New York uh, in managing through this this change and crisis that many of us are experiencing. So Mordecai. Thank you, Deb, for the introduction. And um, I want to thank Open Mind for organizing this um, web briefing. Um, so I want to start with thinking about the world of an autistic child in the times of COVID-19. Um, thinking about the sudden transition to the new reality and you know, an environment, the lack of structure and schedule, um, you know, during these times, the increased stress levels in the home environment, 
um, the new COVID, you know, related priorities and goals that we need to start focusing and updating the treatment plans, you know, in terms of all the, um, in addition or in place of regular goals and priorities, um, and the increased stress levels in the total environment. Um, in times like these, um, our children with autism need quality ABA treatment more than ever. Um, and above that, and that brings us to the next slide, um, thinking about the telehealth challenge, specifically when it comes to autism and ABA. So starting from the prerequisite skills um, that's required just for a child to be able to participate in telehealth services, um, the, the hindrances or, or the limitations in prompting procedures where you, for example, you can't um, you know, utilize hand-over-hand -hand prompting when you're doing telehealth. Um, the, met the methods of reinforcement are pretty limited as well. Um, considering safety concerns, when we want to use um, different procedures such as extinction, which um, are more limited due to not being in the same physical environment with the child, and then competing distractions on the, on the screen. So as the COVID-19 situation um, just turned the world over, you know, um, upside down, we quickly had to adopt especially in the epic center of the world um, or in the United States, um, dealing with, with um, such sudden changes and shifts to be able to effectively work and support our um, clinicians, um, as well as working with the payers to get the guidelines and collaborate to come up with a, with a, a clinically sound and evidence-based um, model. That's something that we very, very quickly um, um, you know, pulled up our sleeves and got to work. So in the next slide, I wanna talk about an article which I co-authored um, with um, my colleague, Tom Blanco, as well as another um, two researchers. And we basically, our, um, our idea was to find different considerations and behind the scenes um, um, factors that we can actually highlight different evidence-based practices that can basically help in the effectiveness and the clinical justification of telehealth services. And as Deb mentioned, um, supervision is, 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 is something that different states and payers um, were very open and, and, and allowing to do through telehealth, but specifically a behavior technician um, delivering the bulk of the direct treatment to our children in a remote and telehealth setting, that's something that we want to see what evidence-based practices are there um, considering all the different background factors. So our article is actually featured and first um, published on the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence blog by Sarah Litzak, um, and it's got a lot of traction. Basically what we wanted to do is, um, in addition to us being able to solve um, and get ready very quickly and come up with um, different insights we wanted to share with the rest of the world. What telehealth in such um, dramatic and unprecedented times, how it would look like and how we can justify it. So the next slide um, is basically um, part of what we, um, um, a screenshot of, of part of what we featured in the article, which started with a telehealth clinical effectiveness survey um, for each practice, and that's what we implemented at Encore, and we shared it with, um, with the world to be able to implement, to start with thinking about the prerequisite skills that a child needs to be able to participate in effective telehealth um, sessions, um, starting with um, the prerequisite basic skills as looking at a screen, coming to a work area upon request of the, you know, from the petition or via video, um, responding um, to previous um, mastered instructions um, via video, identify items on the screen receptively and expressively, um, responding to social praise delivered via video, remaining seated um, during video instruction without prompts from some family members and others in the room, and obviously attending to the screen without engaging in problem behavior, um, such as swiping to a different screen or pressing a different button, et cetera. So we started with um, um, sort of like a task analysis to, to, to see where the child is with the prerequisite skills and followed by um, a, a comprehensive survey, which is 
basically um, challenging each BCBA and each clinician. Um, how do you feel about being ready for about the child's readiness um, um, to participate in, in telehealth um, um, treatment, as well as um, what considerations would you would you do? What type of parental involvement or training would you need um, in order to get the child prepared for telehealth se um, sessions, as well as um, you know implementing a sign off um, procedure for the clinical director to sign off and approve? The clinical justification, um, and and rather using this as almost like a plan of action in implementing um, all the steps needed to um, you know for effectiveness um, of telehealth. So in the next slide is basically what we started um, outlining in the article, and and we felt that we have to implement that step number one is about training the parent to adequately prepare for telehealth. And it starts with um, facilitating and encouraging um, the BCBAs and the parents to work together to teach prerequisite skills to the client. So if we identify um, any prerequisite skills that needs help, so in order to be prepared for effective clinical treatment uh, via telehealth, we need the parent's help. So we need to partner with the parents to actually be able to physically, um, before telehealth, directly um, you know, work with the child and reinforce um, applicable skills for, um, for as prerequisites to telehealth. The second thing would be identify potential safety issues and provide guidance on the implementation of any intervention so that we can have the parents' involvement and um, obviously safety is, is a real concern. And then obviously clear expectations for telehealth. We want to make sure that the parents have the right expectations um, and our priorities and expectations are aligned. And lastly, a clear plan for giving feedback to the BCBA throughout the process. That brings us to the next slide. After we accomplished with um, outlining different considerations and, um, and procedures in, in working together with the parents to get ready, next came the training the trainer um, in terms of recalculating and reopening our toolkit and seeing which um, of our existing procedures need modification and which procedures that are typically not so commonly used in ABA sessions would be a better fit. And it's literally retraining our behavior technicians and reinforcing different skills that become just so much more important in a telehealth setting. So in terms of teaching procedures, and we outlined in the article as well, the different resources, considerations, and evidence um, based practices in terms of um, discrete trial training um, and discrimination training on a screen, leveraging different apps or different um, ways to leverage the screen um, to be able to actually um, teach a child via telehealth. Prompting procedures to focus on different prompting procedures um, using visual prompts on the screen, um, verbal prompts, and so on. It's, sort of recalculating the way um, a behavior technician is used to doing prompting procedures. And although we might be used to um, different prompting procedures, now is the time due to the environment and the telehealth environment has to be recalculated. Obviously reinforcement procedures, you cannot give um, a child a physical tangible reinforcement. You can't give them a chocolate for doing um, a good job. So it's, um, it's relying more on um, token economies, and establishing proper um, token economies based on updated preference assessments um, and really training the behavior technician to leverage that um, token economy as well as leveraging self-monitoring and other um, ABA methodology, which would be very appropriate um, and evidence-based throughout these times. Um, active student response is something that Skinner um, was very um, passionate about in terms of making sure that the students are actively engaged and not falling back and not missing anything. Um, so utilizing, um, you know, ASR type of, of methodology is something to really um, encourage and train our um, behavior technicians to, to um, utilize those different methods to engage and, and, and reinforce um, our students' engagement um, um, throughout the sessions. 
safety measures is obviously um, most important if a behavior technician is used to um, um, utilizing extinction um, procedures or even um, differential reinforcement, which might elicit different um, problem behaviors or extinction bursts. Um, that's something that, you know, just to update the behavior technician um, about the different um, cautious measures or not utilizing different extinction procedures while, um, while during the telehealth um, 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 times um, and perhaps relying more on um, replacement behaviors and so on. Um, and obviously another um, thing that we point out in the article um, and that we trained our behavior technicians is utilizing visual schedules and just providing that stru structure um, um, on the screen so that we get our children um, really calm and structured and organized so that um, we get them engaged and they know what to expect and what's coming. Next slide, please. So the next one is our social skills challenge. Um, obviously, there are tremendous benefits when it comes to social skills training, especially in an isolated time, such as COVID-19 times, where children are, 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 we're all very isolated, but children with autism are not among their peers. And um, in addition to that, we, are, we can't take advantage of so many of our reinforcement methods. So natural reinforcement of a child being reinforced um, via responding to verbal communication, um, another child or another adult um, reciprocating, that's something that we're losing out in terms of the challenges that the social skills training um, would, re would bring um, um, you know, via telehealth. So the three main um, challenges when it comes to um, social, groups, uh, social groups via telehealth, um, the first thing is connectivity. We're all very familiar when we want to get a few people on, on, on a teleconference, on a video conference with the uh, connection issues and until everybody gets onto the session, um, try to think about um, autistic individuals that, uh, that are just more challenged and just getting together a group um, via telehealth brings its own challenges. And, and the second challenge is, is, is basically having control um, on the group with having multiple children, um, you know, participating in the group, um, it's very difficult for a behavior technician to really be able to structure proper sessions. And the last, um, logistically just scheduling all the different children to be um, present at the same time um, and being able to participate in the same meeting um, is just a challenge. So we put our minds together and that brings us to the next slide. And we introduced something um, that we call social pals, um, and it's something that we packaged and branded that way um, for our tech, for our um, clinicians, for the parents, and even for the students. Um, something that we wanted to um, um, sort of come up with a very concrete and um, structured method that we can utilize um, all the different benefits that a social group brings, while really motivating clinicians, parents, and children to engage in this um, in this structure. So basically the idea is distance socialization in a socially distant world. Um, so what we did basically, we paired together PALs based on level of function. So we want each PAL to be able to reinforce another. We're, we would be very careful not to have a nonverbal child basically put the communication and um, um, the verbal behavior on extinction. So um, coming up with the proper level of function, appearing together two pals that would be a good fit um, was the first thing that we, um, we established. And then um, it would be overseen by, and facilitated by a skilled behavior technician. So the children, they know that this is my pal and this is my schedule and this is the behavior technician actually facilitating um, and overseen um, by. And lastly, um, the outcomes that we're looking for and that we're getting um, is the opportunity to socialize and naturally reinforce social communication. So um, needless to say, um, when we introduce this to parents, providers, and even children, we've been faced with incredible enthusiasm um, and, and a lot of different benefits that we didn't even consider initially that parents brought up um, in terms of being able to peer um, 
two children in different geographic locations that they that are a good fit to get to know each other and to reinforce each other's um, communication and verbal behavior. That's something that telehealth actually enables. Um, parents were extremely um, um, enthusiastic about the idea of, of their child focusing on, on communicating and engaging with a pal and friendship skills. Um, and then um, lastly, um, parents were um, extremely um, um, enthusiastic about the idea of not having to coordinate with so many other um, 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 schedules and just having that consistency um, it was something that you know our parents, children, and um, clinicians were really excited about. Next slide, please. Um, so basically just to wrap up, I'm sorry, um, there was one more slide that I missed. Um, so, so basically the, the lessons learned um, based on our experience um, was the innovation and the recalculation of every BCBA really opening up their treatment plan to see what are the priorities, what are the goals that we should be focusing on right now during um, these unprecedented times, as well as rethinking what strategies are dusty in their book, um, uh, on their bookshelf and um, really rethinking what would be most applicable and an opportunity for more collaboration and more training with our behavior technicians um, as well as parents um, just brought a new level of innovation, collaboration and partnership um, to a level that um, we didn't foresee and um, we're really pleased with the outcomes that we have. Um, I'd like to give over the stage to Colin, and we're excited to hear his experience. Hello, folks. I'm uh, Colin Davidian, and uh, the CEO of Gateway Learning Group. And if you go to the next slide. So I think you're going to hear a lot of themes echoed in what I talk about and what Mordecai talked about. Uh, there um, has been a a massive transformation in our in our field and uh, it's happening still and uh, there's a lot of communication happening between providers and payers as, as as we go through this so there's a lot of common things that we're we're um, hitting upon and a lot of common learnings that we're going to just start with a little bit about gateway um, gateway was founded in 2005 so we've been around for uh, quite a while as far as the, the field of autism goes we operate in three states, California, Colorado, Oregon. This is an important fact uh, as you think about what I'm going to be saying versus what Mordecai was talking about. The states where we operate have not been hit as hard with the COVID crisis as New York has. So um, for instance, we have been able to carry on um, in-person services with clients, but in a much more limited fashion than we did previously, uh, in addition to the telehealth work that we're doing. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, as an agency, we have about 500 staff and about 700 clients, and we provide our services in home and in school. So we do not operate uh, large centers. We have some small center activity, but for the most part, we're serving our clients in home and in school. There's an important caveat here that uh, I just want to make sure if it isn't obvious already yet. We, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't know what's going to happen over the next few months, and I certainly don't feel like we have it all figured out. So what I'm going to try to transmit to the audience today is just what we've learned so far and what we are doing today. But um, um, th so much is going to evolve over the next few months as we hear more from health authorities and uh, we learn more as a field about how to apply uh, this new, these new forms of learning. If there is any, uh, if there is any, any silver lining here to, you know, the unfortunate um, events happening across the country it is that at least in our field, causing us all to think differently about things and really, um, I think Mordecai said, open up the books and, and re rethink our practices, which is, I completely agree with, uh, that's a healthy thing for us to do. We can, practices and, and fields can get very stuck in their ways and sometimes just shaking things up a little bit can expose new opportunities. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that we come out of this um, better as a, as, a, as a field and as a practice and we went into it. Next slide. So challenges presented by the crisis. So number one, 
obviously risk of infection to staff and clients. Our number one concern is the safety of our community and uh, the, the, the things that did, didn't carry any risk pre- previously all of a sudden <laughs> can be, are suddenly high risk activities. Uh, that, uh, that, that the most important change that's occurred. Number two, limited access to patient homes and schools. Uh, the, the places where we were providing services are either closed off to us or limited and restricted. Uh, number three, patient family lives are upended. I, I, I can't emphasize as much enough as I talk to families how important this is to them. When families are at home, working from home, um, when multiple kids are home from school taking classes over, tel- uh, over, over Zoom, um, it really changes the dynamic in, in the home. And um, it, it, there's a shakeup within the home that um, for us is something that we need to grapple with and, and each family is a little bit different there, but it, it requires us to think, think again about how we provide the services and when we provide the services and where. And then lastly, client and staff discomfort with a change service model. This is really specifically talking about the, the, mostly the shift to telehealth and the, 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 the discomfort for some that, that's initially created. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we have to figure out ways through education and training that uh, we can overcome some of the, the, uh, the discomfort that at least the irrational parts of that discomfort that are there. So what is our, our response then? Um, so uh, three, three elements to it. Number one, um, we've implemented new health and safety protocols. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a dreaded four-letter word. Uh, we, we formed a committee. <laughs> and as soon as, the, as soon as the shelter in place orders took, took effect in, the, in, in California, uh, we as an organization formed a committee to try to figure this out. We uh, essentially shut down our business for several days. Um, we rethought everything that we do and um, released new policies and protocols that were appropriate for uh, this, this, this new, new phase that, of, that we're in here. Uh, the second thing is telehealth. So uh, uh, introducing telehealth, as, as Mordecai said, has been crucial in this, in this crisis, and I'll talk more about that. And then lastly, monitoring effects and outcomes. We as an organization are very data oriented. We have um, enormous amounts of data on all of the uh, cases that we have uh, down to the event level and what's happening in each event. And um, we apply that rigorously, that data, that those learnings from our data to our practices. So we create a feedback loop within your organization. I'll talk a little bit about how we're trying to apply that in this crisis. Next slide. So in terms of health and safety practices, um, we, you know, this, again, the, this, this happened very quickly at first. Uh, we released new health and safety practices uh, in what seemed like overnight, but it probably was three or four days. And uh, we spent, um, and then we've evolved them since then. So this has not been a stagnant, this has not been a static set of policies. We are continually reviewing and evolving. A lot of the, the, the uh, content for the initial set of policies and the evolution really came from our families, um, from our families telling us what's important to them. So the first element of it is minimizing contact. So um, one, uh, uh, one, what's not said here, which we'll talk about in a minute, is introducing telehealth as the first and foremost way to minimize contact. Uh, we have limited clinicians who do see clients to two or less clients per clinician. We've also um, uh, put in place new requirements around uh, cl- clinicians' activities outside of work. So we, while we didn't, we didn't take as much concern previously in second jobs, for instance, that our clinicians have. Now we are much more interested in understanding what those other activities are and how they might uh, expose uh, our clinicians to um, to the COVID virus. Um, and then um, we have also, in the minimizing contact category, found alternative ways to address the goals that do require physical contact. Because even when we are in person with the client, we are not permitted to anymore touch the client, which was, which was a part of the services previously. So we are socially distant in those in-person, um, uh, in those in-person contacts. Uh, second element here set, set what health and safety standards for the workspace. And for us, the workspace is in the home or in the school. 
So there's a lot to this, but I'm just, uh, you know, the highlights here are we do require masks and gloves. Uh, we do require a clean workspace for our clinicians. There's, there's protocols and procedures we go through um, to clean the workspace and ensure it's safe prior to, prior to beginning any sessions. And then um, lastly, uh, we, we do have, um, you know, a, uh, a, a policy of client-led protocol decisions. So clients can take any policies that we have and they can escalate them if they want to. So they can say, that's not enough for me. I also want to do X, Y, or Z. We're, we're very open to that. Um, um, as, 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 you know, to the, to the, the most extreme form of that is many clients have opted out of in-person services entirely. Um, and so for the clients who have still kept within the services, uh, who have still maintained in-person services, we implement these policies. And then at the most extreme end, there's a, a set of clients who are not doing in-person services at all, and which leads us to our next slide talking about telehealth. So as Mordecai talked about, um, Telehealth is um, kind of there's a, a, a new a new beginning for our field as we realize how valuable and important telehealth can be. Um, and uh, we went into this crisis uh, providing a certain set of our services through telehealth. Those are what we call the supervisory services, and that really consists of two basic things. One is training of the families, so providing training to the caregiver, and the other is supervising the staff who is providing the direct therapy. Uh, that's what we, that's a, the summary of what we call supervisory services. There's also things like assessments go into it and, and other, other, other uh, practices. Prior to the, um, the crisis, many payers, but not all payers permitted these supervisory services to be done telehealth. We were offering them via telehealth, but frankly, most of our providers preferred to just go and see the clients in person. It was, uh, they felt it was a, um, an easier, um, and more impactful method of providing those services at the time. And, um, but I think what we've learned through this crisis is that that was probably a, a false belief in many ways. Um, most of these supervisory services we're seeing can be done just as well or better in, um, in, a, uh, in, in a telehealth format. Uh, we entirely moved our supervisory services to in-person. So when I talk about providing in-person services, the, that is not, does not include these supervisory services. Um, it only includes the direct service line below. Um, and uh, it's been a, a huge success, I'd say. Uh, the feedback from clinicians and parents is, and basically, I didn't think it was going to be as effective as it, as it is. And um, um, largely the feedback from folks is they don't expect this to ever go back to the way it was, even if the crisis ended tomorrow and there were no health concerns at all, which I don't expect to happen. But if you imagine that the people are still saying they do not want to go back to the old way, uh, there's probably a, um, um, a, a need to have a certain amount of in-person telehealth, a small amount, I'm sorry, in-person uh, supervisor services, but it will never go back to being at 95% it was prior to the crisis. Direct therapy, we're seeing a, a, a different picture. Um, direct therapy, from our perspective, we're seeing for some patients it has been very effective. For other patients, it has not been as effective. It really depends on who we're talking about. And Mordecai did a great job of laying out sort of a checklist of what um, uh, what conditions might uh, uh, might indicate that a patient or client is more appropriate for telehealth. Uh, we don't have such a uh, a um, um, the detailed checklist as they do, but we go through some of the same exercise to think about is this child going to work with telehealth or not? Um, and there's also, I'd say, a gray area here where it's not completely binary. So let's, we shouldn't just think about direct therapy um, being provided binary. And they, they, maybe just in case folks don't know, just a little bit back on here, direct therapy is the core of our service. Uh, this is provided anywhere from 10 to 40 hours per week with the client. So it's a very, very significant amount of time. And there is a gray area here where we see a lot of clients benefiting from some direct ter therapy telehealth, but we don't see many clients who benefit from their entire service portfolio being turned over to re direct therapy telehealth. There's a lot of things which really for these, um, uh, these clients are, are, are just better done in person. And the amount, the percentage of appropriate telehealth we're seeing really varies from client to client. Um, and then the last section here is social skills. Uh, and this is where you have a group of clients um, meeting together uh, with one or more clinicians present um, to build socialization skills. 
And um, this, we are seeing a lot of success here. And I think Mordecai, I'm not going to do justice to it the way that Mordecai did, uh, but uh, there's been a lot of um, good things coming out of this. And, and if you think about it and going forward in the future for the foreseeable future, um, virtual socialization is going to be become the norm and us providing this type of service to in a virtual format is, is, is um, probably a good thing to help these clients get uh, accustomed to that. Next slide. Okay, uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is outcomes. As I said before, we as an, as an agency um, gather a ton of data on our, our patients and, and we um, put it all into a centralized warehouse where we then you know, run a lot of analytics on that data to draw conclusions about the performance of our practice and the performance of, of uh, different methodologies. And um, I, at this time, I wish I had a, something I could tell you about how the COVID crisis has affected our client base. It's still a little bit early for us to speak to that. Uh, there's just not enough um, outcome data that's been produced yet to, to have a, to draw any, any specific conclusions. But instead, what I thought I'd share with you is a, a very relevant um, corollary, which is just telehealth in general. We, as, we, as I said, we have been doing telehealth in some form for quite some time as an agency um, and as a field. And we've been collecting data on how much telehealth has been done by our clinicians and um, how that performance, how that's affected the performance. So just to describe what you're looking at here, um, we, um, we have on the x-axis is the percentage of telehealth time uh, that is being conducted by our BCBA. So this is that supervisory service I mentioned earlier. So what percentage of supervisory services were conducted by telehealth? And then on the um, y-axis, you have their improvement in, um, you know, one of the key benchmarks in our field, which is the, the, the Vineland, um, and I'm going to deal with what the Vineland is, uh, but it is a, a key benchmark that we use for measuring progress in the field of autism. And um, this is a rough cut. I don't want to uh, uh, tell folks that this is uh, highly statistically analyzed at this point, but the, a rough, the rough correlation that we've drawn between the, uh, the usage of telehealth and the in change in outcomes is, is, um, um, is, a, is a positive one, where it, at least we can say telehealth has historically not adversely impacted our clients. The use of telehealth has not adversely impacted our clients, which is very good. It bodes well for the changes that we're making now in this dramatic shift to more telehealth. Um, this bears continued monitoring. We were, we're making a massive shift here. If you look at the x-axis here, we saw between zero and 25% or so telehealth, and now we're moving, we're doing a step function shift to 75% to 100% of time being done by telehealth. So this, we'll see if this correlation holds, um, but so far, so good is what we're, we're seeing with this. And as, a, as an agency, we're also, we're continuing to do analysis like this across different aspects of, of um, our practice and different aspects of the changes that we're making. Um, we'll be doing similar analyses, for instance, on the direct therapy to see how the shift of direct therapy to telehealth um, affects, affects outcomes. And that's it from us. Um, I think next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Deb and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Colin and Mordecai. We'll have a little time at the end to answer questions uh, from the audience, but, but great information. I, I wanna talk a little bit about what payers are doing in, in the midst of this COVID epidemic, pandemic. And I, if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, what we're seeing is uh, in some cases, uh, cost share waivers uh, for in-network providers to encourage access during this, this period of challenging access and, and almost uh, all services or most services being delivered virtually. I know I remember well the week of March 16th, contacting all the payers, scrambling to see you know, who was going to allow for virtual services since that wasn't a common thread in the autism area. We did see payers uh, rally and come out with formal postings. Uh, many have waivers, some have waivers in place until uh, the end of May and into June. Uh, most are allowing video and telephonic ABA services and some support services through telephone only, and then very specific guidance on billing. I'm gonna just, if you go to the next slide, I'll just show you a few. 
Aetna is one of the few national payers that I've seen actually have a cost share waiver for ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis, Telemedicine Services. They're very uh, specific on which codes uh, that, that you can use uh, telehealth with within the autism space and what the billing procedures are, the GT or the 95 modifier. Cigna, on the other hand, has not done any cost share waivers, actually not just in autism, but in behavioral health and addiction services as well. That has not been their approach. However, uh, they are allowing for telephonic and uh, telehealth services uh, for ABA, and again, very prescriptive on the billing. I would recommend if you're a provider organization to constantly check the payer websites. If you go to the next slide, we'll show you a couple of others. Constantly go out there because there are updates on a regular basis. Optum, for example, just recently extended uh, the window through May 31st. Uh, however, they are not uh, instituting any type of cost share waivers for autism, but they are allowing uh, for virtual visits and some telephonic only sessions. You'll see at the bottom right corner of the screen, uh, they have a couple of codes that are exceptions because they feel those require on-site services with multiple staff presence, which is, which is logical. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Yagnesh talk a little bit about what Magellan is doing. And uh, given they are a vendor to other uh, healthcare organizations, I know it's, uh, it's not a simple uh, answer, but I'll let Yagnesh explain what Magellan is doing and, and how they mobilized to, to tackle this uh, when COVID raised its ugly head. So, Yagnesh, I'll pass it to you. And I also want to say uh, thank you to my uh, colleagues who had a chance to uh, present earlier. Uh, I, was, I was saying earlier to uh, uh, open mind, I'm really fortunate that uh, through the development of what are the next steps and how are we looking at the landscape of my position here as the vice president of autism with the gentleman is on the ground, how are parents feeling? What are your staff feeling like? And that being hey. said, uh, two of the people that I reached yeah. out to, uh, yeah, go ahead. I was saying, I guess we're having a little bit of a sound problem, or maybe it's me, so just might want to check your headset a minute. I'm also hearing the, the garbled sound, too. Is this a little bit better? Uh, keep, going. <laughs> keep going. Yeah, you may want to start over because we did miss the first minute of what you said. Yeah, it's it's pretty. You may want to take your maybe you can remove the headset. Um, You could also try dialing in by phone, and in the meantime, we could address some of the questions that have come yeah. in for um, the earlier speakers. Um, yeah, Mardukai, while we are getting situated with this audio situation, can you talk a little bit more about the social PAL model and um, tell us how it's been used and its effectiveness? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I have connectivity issues as well. You hear me clearer now? Yeah, we yes. hear you. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so in terms of the social panels, as I mentioned um, um, earlier, um, it's something that it's, it's not a new, totally new concept, but it's something that we wanted to structure and organize in a way where um, parents can actually, parents and providers can have a clear protocol um, to follow um so that it can be streamlined and um effective across the board without each individual clinician doing their own research and development um so we're actually very excited we're 
about to publish an article um, outlining all the different steps that we did, um, all the considerations, um, as well as different goals and targets that would commonly be um, used and recommended, um, along with different um, discriminators the discriminative stimulus and um, teaching instructions. So to get um, clinicians sort of a head start to be able to use um, this protocol and be effective um, um, with the social pals um, model. And as Kala mentioned, um, telecommunication or video conferencing, it's something, it's a skill that's been used in the entire world, not only during COVID and not only um, for therapy. So in terms of, of area of focus and generalization of skills, it's actually a very, very, um, you know, recommended and pref it's, it's turning out to be a recommended and preferred option to work on communication skills via teleconferencing or video conferencing. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mordecai. And uh, Yagnesh, it looks like you're ready again. We do apologize. Uh, technology is always your friend until it isn't. So let's try that again. Thanks. Certainly. Can you all hear me now? That's great. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, so as, as I was saying uh, earlier, and I apologize for the technical difficulties, uh, when everything first happened, um, we kept our ear to the ground. And uh, I was saying earlier to our, our colleagues here on this call is uh, by keeping our ear to the ground and in my position as the, the vice president of autism for Magellan and overseeing the national product for Magellan throughout the country, which is a uh, uh, 22 health plans across 35 states and 10,000 members receiving ABA services under our management. Uh, two of the people I reached out to almost immediately were both Colin and Mordecai. Uh, Colin to see what was the pulse from his organization, what were families feeling like, what was the team feeling like, um, what was the organization looking like, what does it look like from early glimpses on, on a long-term impact. And then with Mordecai, with the you saw what he was putting out there with regards to the telehealth survey and Magellan immediately warmed to that idea. When I say Magellan, I'm saying uh, we went to Mordecai, asked for his permission. Can we utilize this? Can we disseminate your research and the work that you and your colleagues have done and, and hand this out to providers should they have any questions? And one thing that we saw coming out of this was the collaborative, the fast responses, um, I believe I was emailing with Mordecai at six o'clock my time, nine o'clock his time, and it was just a rapid response just so that we could try to disseminate information as fast as possible and try to get the entire industry, and more importantly, the members and the families, the help and the resources that they needed uh, as fast as possible. Uh, so one of the things that we did as an organization is that we started to immediately look at what is happening around the country. You know, un un unfortunately, uh, we, we know that some of the challenges that we, we saw through the responses of, of COVID and how different states had different uh, responses on what was happening with stay-at-home orders. Uh, for instance, we have a large book of business here in California, and we know that California was one of the first states to really mobilize that stay-at-home orders, which then told us, okay, this is what we're going to do in both California as well as New Jersey. We're going to mobilize as fast as possible. But other states, like Texas and Florida, for instance, They've had a little bit more of a relaxed approach to the stay-at-home orders, as you can see with the graph at the very bottom. And so what that forced us to do was to look at it on a state-by-state -state basis and work with providers within those states. It, one, what is the state mandating? And then two, what can you do with families who, are, who have fear, who have trepidation about what's happening here? Uh, one of the things that we know with COVID is the high preponderance of individuals who are impacted with COVID because of, of a pre-existing condition. 70% of individuals with autism have some kind of a comorbid, comorbid, comorbid diagnosis of either physical and or mental behavior health, which then exposes this population to being at a higher likelihood of potentially uh, being a carrier. And that's not something that we want, to, uh, we want to hang our hats on. So we kept our ears to the ground and we constantly took an eye, kept an eye out for what was happening out there. Magellan's approach historically Magellan's approach historically has been to allow uh, telehealth for in the past for supervision and parent training. So when we went live with telehealth, we immediately endorsed that approach and then we said we're going to continue to keep an eye on what's happening in the industry. 
And as we started to see that this is not going to be a short-term situation, that this is going to run a couple of months, and that families continue to need support, uh, this is something that we started to keep an eye on. So we go over to the next slide. And so as a part of that, what we started to do is really started to wrap our heads around the research, literature, and manuscripts that are being put out there. Uh, I just want to say that I, I couldn't be more proud to be a BCBA and to be in the field of behavior analysis during this time. The way in which our industry mobilized, and they mobilized in a way of research, literature, data, facts. Uh, researchers coming together and, and putting out as much information as possible to help guide decision making based on what uh, industry standards should be. And that was what helped propel places like Magellan to say, okay, we're now going to adopt all codes to be available via telehealth. And one of the other things that we wanted to be able to see from all that is, uh, before we went live with everything, was who can benefit from telehealth? You heard me talk earlier about my conversation with Mordecai on, about all the research articles that we saw and really understanding what the hierarchy is from potentially who would benefit from a telehealth approach, who could benefit from an in-person approach. And we also started to do an analysis on who's putting services on hold right now, which families are saying, you know what, I understand that you have both a telehealth approach and you have in-person that could be available, but right now we're just going to put everything on hold until the dust settles. And so we started to do an analysis and we saw in certain markets, we started to see that upwards of about 40 to 50% of all members were putting services on hold due to fear. That was early on. And as we started to go on, we started to see that that number is coming down as more families are starting to open themselves up. And so as a part of what we started to do in the steps that we took was outreach, outreach to providers, outreach through the health plans, talking to members and saying, what can we do to support you at this time? We know that you're at home. We know that you're at home with your child. And these are stressful times. Uh, for those of us who we've all been in homes, for those of us who have been in homes and worked with families, we know what the stress and the challenges look like in a quote unquote normal society. We can't imagine what it looks like now when everybody's at home and there's the structure is taken away. There's no school for the foreseeable future. In-home services are on hold. Work life is in flux. All sorts of things are happening. So we wanted to be able to see who could benefit from telehealth and what can we do to support those families and understanding what the new normal is. One of the things I said to my team from the very beginning, and I continue to say even to this day, is we cannot afford to be a barrier right now. We have to be supportive, we have to uh, reach out to providers, and we have to understand what they're going through during these challenging times. But as a part of that process as well, is that we wanna be able to understand uh, what our families going through, and what is the provider going to do to help promote the dimensions of ABA. Two in particular is the effectiveness and as well as generalization. Now, one thing that we always know in ABA is that if we're not promoting from generalization from the jump, what are we doing with our ABA program? And so through this process, we're starting to see ABA providers coming with a treatment plan recommendations, really where they're focusing on generalization, where they're focusing on parent training, where they're saying, look, in a normal society, what we'd want to do is recommend X amount of hours, but now we can recommend Y. But in lieu of that, we want to increase our parent consult, parent training, caregiver training. We want to increase those hours so that we can increase opportunities for generalization, so that we can help that parent to manage the behaviors and the situation when we are not there. And so, again, I, I want to say that there have been the, the vast majority of ABA providers have really stepped up during this time and have really started to make the recommendations that they know to be medically necessary. We've also seen uh, a, a handful of providers start to ask for, you know, let's go ahead and do a shortened authorization. Because this is what the stay-at-home order is saying. This is when it's set to expire. I'll give an example. In California, stay-at-home is set to expire uh, May 15th and 10 days from now. And so you've seen providers say, let's get this authorization through May 15th. After that, we want to be able to see what the stay-at-home orders look like and if we can get back into the home. If we can get back into the home, we'd like to get our hours back up. And to us, that makes complete sense. Right. We want to be able to support the families as much as possible. We want to promote generalization. We want to promote the effectiveness of ABA. And again, on the in-home versus telehealth, one of the things that we're doing as well is uh, my team is disseminating the research and the literature and the manuscripts that are out there. Uh, but one of the things that we want to do is we want to talk to providers about who can benefit from in-home versus telehealth. You know, as you heard me say earlier about it. We have a book of business in California. Um, and within that book of business, we have a large majority, a large number of members who are in the receiving services in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we know that 
uh, that area is one of the hardest hit areas in the country. And so what can we do to ensure that those members are getting telehealth? Well, one of the things that we did, you heard Deb talk about earlier, is that we removed the requirement for uh, HIPAA-based platforms at this very moment. And at this very moment, whether it is video via, tele via a HIPAA-based platform or not HIPAA-based platform, get it going. Or even if it's a telephone, as archaic as it sounds, even if it's a telephone, get that going. Or with, if it's within a Medicaid community or Medi-Cal here in California, what can we do to help bridge those technological gaps so that that family can get the services in, those, in that moment? Because that family is struggling amongst many means, that socioeconomic means, and, and frankly, telehealth may not be a priority given the stressors that they're going through right now. So what can we do collaboratively to help support that family, whether it be in-home or via telehealth? And so really, the big takeaway that we saw uh, from the funder's side uh, on the steps taken during COVID is the collaboration. The rapid response from the ABA community in disseminating research and working collaboratively together to try to find out what are the best next steps. And the sense of humility that everybody had across the board in saying, we don't know, but the more that we can come together and try to find an amenable solution so that the most important denominator in all this, which is the member and the family, is getting the support that they know that they deserve, we're all going to be better off. Next slide. Um, oops. Thanks, Yagnesh. I wanted to, to spend a few minutes asking our panelists about lessons learned because now that we're two months into this or almost two months, and if you could go back in time and say, gee, if I'd known this, uh, I might have uh, handled this transition differently. I, I, I'll give each of our speakers a chance to talk about any lessons learned that they would like to to share. Because I think that there's always great learning from uh, either mistakes or looking back on how you might have handled this differently. So, Colin, I'll start with you. We'll go left to right. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Um, I, I guess if I were to summarize that the most important lesson learned is um, the importance of flexibility within the organization and the ability to change rapidly. So uh, we, we didn't see this coming. We had to react quickly. And uh, the, 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 the parts of our organization that shine were the ones who were the quickest to move and react to help our client base and our staff um, stay safe and healthy. And that was the most important thing that we could do. So flexibility and reactivity were probably the biggest lessons that we learned. Great. How about you, Mordecai? Well, I would say um, it's all about um, collaboration. So um, the first number on the slide in terms of parental engagement. So due to the circumstances, they just had to be more engaged. But as they were more engaged, they were starting to appreciate more and more just by, by naturally participating more in the session and generalizing all that important work that was done. And it's also a time where they're with their children just that much more. They're not at work or they're working from at home and they're around their children. So the parental engagement that is um, facilitated is just remarkable. And um, I think that that engagement has been reinforced by the outcomes that the, that the parents are actually seeing um, with, the, with the important work that we're doing. Um, and then the second thing in terms of collaboration is similar to what Yagnes was saying, but um, provide us working together, um, and not only with each other, but working together with payers as well. When we hear payers, such as we've just, um, um, you know, listened to Yagnish talk almost like with the same passion as providers, that makes us be able to really accomplish very, very quickly and just come through for our families that need us more than ever. Great. And how about you, Yagnish? Any lessons learned? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think Colin said it, and I'll just go ahead and take a step further from it, is that I think that we weren't, admittedly, none of us were prepared for this, right? I mean, none of us were prepared for uh, what would happen if this were to ever to occur. And I think one of the lessons that we learned from this is uh, the need for looking at it from a global level and uh, trying to come together even faster than what we did, right? Establishing work groups, establishing uh, committees, establishing knowing and known and trust uh, relationships and coming together and say, okay, after the first week or within the first week, hey, let's all meet together. Okay, what's going on? Tell me what's happening. 
It's something that's happening in New York. Tell me what's happening in San Francisco. Tell me what's happening around the other country, parts of the country. Now, what can we do to help support you? And what can I do to go to my senior leadership and see what can we do differently to help support you all as the providers? Because you all as the providers, uh, we're only going to be as successful as you are. And so one of the other things as well that uh, has come out of this uh, is the push for innovation. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, I've been in intently um, interested in for a number of years uh, since I've joined Magellan. In, uh, what are we going to do differently within the field of ABA versus saying we're going to continue with this in-home or in-clinic-based program? And is the push now for telehealth going to drive that differently as we go into the future now? Are there going to be families? And one thing that we're monitoring or we're going to be taking a look at is our families going to be saying, no, you know what? We actually prefer the telehealth approach. And one thing that we can see through all that is early signs of what your claims data looks like on utilization of caregiver training. The utilization in a pre-COVID and a post, or in a current COVID society is markedly different. We're seeing that caregiver training really increase. We're seeing BCBAs talking with parents. And should that now be utilized more and more via telehealth as we go into the future? And that's something that we're gonna to want to really start having more and more conversations with our providers uh, as the days and the weeks go on. Yeah, I guess I asked the providers, have you seen caregiver training change or a parent reaction to the caregiver training change post-COVID? We've seen, we've seen the um, evidence of what Yagnesh is saying, for sure. There's a lot more parent training happening. And um, what's interesting is, in many ways, the dynamic is not any different than what our uh, leading edge clients were doing pre-crisis. The leading edge clients had figured out pre-crisis that, hey, wait a second. If I can just get on video anytime and talk to a, not anytime, but, you know, with some, with reasonable amount of notice, do a 15 minute mm -hmm. session, a half hour session with the BCBA who's helping my child. That's great. The immediacy of that response and that feedback is much better than having a, you know, a one hour session once every two weeks. So that immediacy to help with emergent situations has been really powerful and the most powerful part of parent training. And I don't think that's going away in any way. Mordecai, did you want to add to that? Because I definitely, telehealth gives you a flexibility that, you know, can make a meaningful difference. Anything you would add to um, either parent reaction or I would say staff reaction too. I, my, my experience with telehealth is the recipient of the services is usually faster to adopt than sometimes the um, provider staff themselves, the clinicians. So I'm curious uh, if you've seen uh, any turnover as a result of this or change in staff behavior or response to, to moving so rapidly and so more completely to, to virtual care. So um, it's a great question. So, you know, obviously the providers are always very, um, you know, everybody, nobody likes change, um, but, but We've seen like a different part, a different streak coming come out, an uh, innovative streak, um, a problem solving streak, as well as like they were themselves pleasantly surprised. Um, and I think it was like less expected to be as, as successful. So I would say, you know, that reaction was very nice to see. And I, and I think it had a very strong impact in, in the enthusiasm and the motivation for the providers just to really invest even more and, you know, and do a great job. Great. So the the, the sixty six thousand dollar question, <laughs> you know, is this here for the long term? Did, will will we go back to, you know, less telehealth in the autism space? You know, how do we think it will shift and change? I know my personal opinion is the parent and caregivers are going to recognize the the value and convenience of this approach. And I think a lot of it will be here to stay, but I'm curious uh, what my colleagues think. Uh, how about, we'll start with on the payer side. Yeah, Agnes, what do you think? Yeah, you know, one of the things that we saw uh, pre-COVID was almost a reluctance to utilize telehealth with many, many providers. Uh, if we saw that utilization was low, we would always say, well, what about telehealth? Can we utilize that? Can we adopt that? 
And in many instances, the providers would say, you know what, no, it's okay, we'll try to get there in person. For one reason or the other, many a times it had to do with the technological adaptations, which we totally understand, right? Um, and so I am very curious to see how many more providers are going to want to say going forward, this is what we're going to want to use on a, on a more permanent basis with select situations. All right, Nina, Nina, did you want to yeah, ask, ask a few of the chat questions? Sure. Um, on a related note here, Agnesh, to what you just said, and maybe all of you have an opinion on this. Um, so Amber says she has early intervention specialists, not BCBAs, who are working with children birth to age three. And most of the visits they have are 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and they work around the family's routine and activities. but they are seeing a decrease in visits because the families are so anxious. Uh, wondering if that's a situation any of you can relate to and what advice you might offer. Yeah, we're, we're seeing, um, I, I, we are seeing definitely a decrease in overall visits. Um, many parents, I think Yagnesh alluded to this, have become gun shy for, for services overall. Um, that's, and what we have seen, though, and I think Agnes said this as well, is, is a shift slowly. They're getting more comfortable with the idea, depending on the family, with opening up to the idea of telehealth or opening up to the idea of in person. Um, you know, we, we're letting the patients and families guide this process um, with information and education from us. Um, but we have absolutely seen that um, decrease in services among some families. I would just say um, very quickly that it, it, there's really a difference in, in different ages and different level of function. So with, with like ages, um, you know, one to three, um, it needs a lot of parental involvement and, you know, even, you know, ongoing and you can't really fade out the parents. If you're dealing with a child that's a little bit older, you might need the parental involvement initially to set it up and to support, but they can go off on their own. Um, but with more challenging children, we've definitely seen parents saying, you know what, we don't need the full utilization now. Let's do one hour in the morning, one hour later in the afternoon. And that should be, you know, doing the job as, you know, times are really overwhelming now. Great. Thank you all so much for um, explaining that. Um, I think, Colin, you referred to a cost share um, situation. No, it wasn't. I don't you. think that was me, Deb or Yagnesh. Oh, yeah. Deb, can you explain that? Yeah. But, uh, when we say cost share, you know, in uh, commercial insurance, typically the consumer has a copay, you know, maybe a $45, $25 copay to access services. So during this period uh, of COVID, many um, of the payers have uh, waived that cost share. So if I normally paid $25, $45 to do a, a visit or a telehealth visit, I would have no out-of-pocket expenses, no cost share, in other words, to um, partake in services delivered through telehealth. So many of the payers have waived, or some of the payers, I should say some, <laughs> uh, have waived the cost share, very few for autism services, Aetna being a, an example, uh, but many have waived the, the co-pays and co-insurance and other out-of-pocket expenses for delivery of telehealth services. I think as a means of you know, promoting access and really opening the door, realizing it's you know, very challenging right now, not to mention uh, the, you know, the current economics of the situation with new job losses etc. Now, I think many of those are in place for a limited period of time uh, as, as the payers, managed care companies continue to evaluate uh, the, the long-term plans. Great, thank you for that. And um, with that, I think with that, we've addressed all the questions that have come in. You've touched upon um, some of these advanced questions that came in from our members. Um, so I do want to say thank you so much, Colin, Mardukai, Agnesh, and Deb. Um, this was a great conversation, and I know it offered a lot of insights for our members on the call. Uh, we know that you are on the front lines, and every minute is precious. So all the time that you've taken to share is very valuable, and we will make uh, the recording and all these resources available uh, to our participants as well. But uh, 
we wish you good luck as you continue to do good work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.